So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope there's somebody watching at the moment now, um, and I hope you had a good week and you got a chance to practice. Uh, this is week two of the Attention Based Training Program. Um, and I just want to thank everybody who tuned in last week. I, I think it was um, a, a good a good experiment that, that worked well, I think. Um, and I hope you've all managed to be able to access the folders that are attached to the program. Again, if you have any issues um, accessing any of these folders, please give me a shout during the week or after the session itself. Um, so as I said, this is week two of an eight week program and hopefully we'll be here on Wednesdays at four o'clock right up until May. So I'll just go into my next slide here. Okay, so just a little bit of a recap um, about last week and I'll go into the mechanics again just to remind you in a minute. Um, and I don't want you to answer these questions now, but I want you to think about it because we will have a Q&A session at the end of, of the um, half hour, 45 minutes here. Um, so I just want to know and I want you to think about it now. Have you chosen your anchor yet? So if you haven't, have a think about that now because we're going to do a practice in a couple of minutes. Um, did you manage to practice at all? Um, if you didn't, that's okay. If you did intermittently, that's okay too. Um, if you did every day, that's fantastic. Um, the first week can be quite hard actually. It can be quite hard to get to grips with it. Um, this is brand new. Um, today is going to be about how to try and embed this habit. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and as I said, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of this um, session today. So hopefully if you've got any questions, we'll get to grips with them at that time. So just a little reminder of the mechanics of attention based training. So you might remember last week that I recommended that we adopt this kind of medita meditation posture. Um, that essentially we're in an upright position with the back not essentially rigid, but just upright and comfortable and that you try and have your hips above your knees where possible and your arms can be resting on your lap or down by your side, whatever is most comfortable for you. This is the recommended posture at the start. Um, now, when you get used to this in an eight weeks time, you can do whatever posture you want. But as I said last week, meditation practice of any kind is not about relaxation, so to speak. It's work and it's not about sleepy time either. It's about work. So I mentioned the anchors a couple of minutes ago and um, it's really important now that you've either hopefully settled on one or if you haven't, maybe today, pick which pick one that that suits you best and stick with that for the rest of the program. So just to remind you again, when we become distracted, it's very useful to have some kind of anchor to hold us down <clears throat> so that um, we don't rise up into a cascade of thinking, especially anxious thinking. So what we can see here, one type of anchor can be a chosen phrase. And one example that I provide here is I am here now, or alternatively, we can use the breath as an anchor to ground us. The breath is always moving, it doesn't have to be any fancy type of breathing and we just follow the breath as the anchor. Um, if you're worried about how you can insert the chosen phrase or mantra into your breathing, um, an example I often give is you can use I am here now in one inhalation and then I am here now in the exhalation or you can break it up, whatever suits. So you can have I am inhale here now in the exhalation. It does require a little bit of playing around with, but um, as I said, pick an anchor that suits you best and stick with that. So hopefully you have an anchor in mind before we practice in a minute or two. And just to remind you again that the whole purpose of the anchor is to help you disengage from distraction. And those types of distractions can be thoughts, emotions, sensations, memories, um, and each time you become distracted, which could be a thousand times in 60 seconds, you simply return to your anchor, whether that be the chosen phrase or whether that be the breath itself. Last week, I asked you to set your timers for two minutes, morning and evening. That was your set practice time. We're going to add another minute on it for this week. Um, but essentially the basic and core practice is that you set your timer for two minutes, you choose your anchor, Hopefully you won't have to pick your anchor anymore because it will be embedded in your practice. And um, once the timer is moving and the seconds are moving ahead, you simply return to your anchor each time you become distracted, then your timer will go off and your practice is done for the day. So that essentially is the mechanics of the basic practice. That is the core. 
we will try and add a minute every week as we progress through the, the program itself. OK, so let's practice what we preach here. And um, before we go into the main topic of this week's session, I want to go through the body scan again. So if you remember from last time, the body scan is a very useful practice that essentially helps us to ground the body and the mind prior to the main attention based training practice. You don't always have to use the body scan, but it's a very useful way to calm a turbulent mind if you're angry or upset or if you've got some pain happening at the moment in your body. It's a very useful way to calm the entire system down. So we'll spend maybe five or six minutes now. I'm going to guide you through um, a body scan practice. Um, and again, if you adopt an upright posture, wherever you're sitting right now, with your feet planted on the ground, and you can rest your arms any way you like. So on your lap, um, on the armrests, or just hanging by your side. So again, we can do this body scan with your eyes open, but it's probably better to do with your eyes closed so that you minimize the number of distractions. I will take you to through the body over the course, course of five or six minutes. Remember that each time you become distracted, simply come back to where we're talking about at the time. If it's your knee, then we refocus on the knee. So once you've adopted a relatively safe and comfortable position, close your eyes. I'm going to ask you to take a deep breath. Hold it for a moment. And then exhale slowly. So we'll begin by bringing your attention down to the toes of your left foot. See if you can feel the individual toes. But don't worry about it if you can't. Can you feel your left big toe? Now bring your attention to the sole of your left foot. Your left ankle. in the top of your foot. Feel your left foot as one unit. And then from your left ankle, you move slowly up into your left calf muscle. Remember that each time we reach a large muscle group, we check if it's tight or not. We try and consciously relax the muscle when we arrive at that point. So relax your left calf muscle. And next we move up into the left knee. And from your left knee, into your left thigh muscle. Relax this large muscle group here. Move slowly up and down from your knee to your hip. And from the left hip then, you move across the pelvis and down into the toes of your right foot. Again, can you sense the individual toes? And from your right big toe, you move into the sole of your right foot and your right heel. In the top of your right foot, rest for a moment at your right ankle. And 
and from the right ankle and the right foot. We move slowly up through the right calf muscle, relaxing it as we move slowly. And we rest again at the right knee. Remember to continue to breathe normally throughout this practice. And from the right knee, we move into the right thigh muscle. We consciously relax the muscle here. We move slowly up till we reach the right hip. Then we come around to the base of the back. And now we're going to move very slowly up either side of the spinal column. And as we move left and right, we're going to consciously relax these large muscle groups <clears throat> until we reach the shoulder blades. And then from the shoulder blades, we move into the left shoulder. This is a muscle group that can be often tense. So again, we consciously relax the muscle here on the left shoulder. And then we bring our attention down to the tips of the fingers of the left hand and the left thumb. Try to get a sense of your entire left hand. And then from the left wrist, we move slowly up through the forearm. We rest for a moment at the left elbow. And from the left elbow, we move up through the upper left arm, relaxing the muscle as we move slowly. And from the left shoulder, we move right across to the right shoulder. Relax the muscle here. And then bring your attention to the tips of the fingers of your right hand. Bring your attention to your whole right hand now, from your fingers to your thumb, to your right wrist. From the wrist, we move up slowly through the forearm. We rest for a moment at the right elbow. And from the right elbow, we move up through the upper arm, relaxing the muscles as we go until we reach the shoulder, the right shoulder. Try and get a sense of both your arms as one unit hanging from your shoulders. And 
And then from your shoulders, we move to the back of your neck and the base of your skull. Feel the weight of your head. And from the neck, we move around to the jaw muscle, either side. Relax the jaw muscle. Unclench your teeth if they're clenched. And then we move slowly up left and right, either side of your face. Pass your cheekbones, your temples, and then smooth out your forehead. Relax the muscles around your eyes. And then bring your attention to the back of your head. Move slowly up towards the top of your head and the scalp. Get a sense of your face and your head as one unit. So before we finish the body scan, I want you to take one large deep breath in. And then exhale slowly. Okay, so that was the body scan. So I think that's a useful way always to start any session like this. It should help to ground you and help get rid of some of the tension from the day that's already been acquired. So really what we're talking about today, assuming that you're still awake and upright, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss how we might be able to a new habit and not just a new habit that stays around for a few weeks, but a sustainable habit that hopefully we can develop and sustain over the years, not just weeks. Um, and as I mentioned last week, it takes on average 66 days to de develop a new habit. And most of these slides here, I will add some links so that you can find the data behind these um, statements that I'm not just making them up. And at the bottom here, you'll see on this slide that there's a link to University College London, um, which references the research group who carried out this study in terms of how long it takes to generate a new habit. So you might be lucky and it might take fewer than 66 days for you, or you might be unlucky and it might take you longer. But the bottom line is it takes quite some time to develop a new sustainable habit. Okay, so we know, and I'm sure you've experienced during the week that meditation practice of any kind, including this one, attention-based training, is difficult. And it's difficult to get into a routine. It takes time and it takes a lot of practice. And um, so what we've done is based again on scientific evidence and research out there, and um, we've put together a small toolkit for you, um, which are the best evidence-based ways that you might be able to develop, <clears throat> excuse me, a new habit. So what we're looking at here is really the current behavioral science strategies that are out there at the moment in terms of best practice. And what I've done is in this slide here, I provide you with, with three sources that if you want more information on where these ideas concepts things here and find out as much as you can about them and read as much. Um, and what really I'm going to talk about, and um, th this is a summary here of six actions really that when combined generate a positive sustainable habit that hopefully lasts for a long period of time. And I'm going to just go through each one um, in a moment. So we'll begin with the first one, which is about ensuring a stable and supportive environment. Um, and a lot of this work was developed by Neil and colleagues in Duke University in the US. And again, if you go into the source list on the previous slide, you'll be able to find out about where these researchers come from and about their research itself. So really what we're talking about is that the number one point of developing a sustainable new habit is to, and especially when we're talking about attention-based training, which is really a sitting habit, that we adopt the same place same time and same position, at least for the first eight weeks. This is also an important point. 
I would urge you to tell everybody that you know, friends and family and colleagues, that you're trying to engage in this practice. Because I know right now you're not walking down any corridors, and but when we do eventually go back to work, if you bump into a colleague in the corridor and they say, well, how's that practice going? And you feel a bit guilty because you didn't practice in the last few days, you'll be really guilted into engaging in practice that night because you'll know you'll bump into that colleague again and they'll remind you about your practice. So the more people you tell about your practice, the more likely you're going to be forced into practicing. So it's another kind of sneaky way to get you to practice with external pressure. Now we don't want to create too much pressure, friendly pressure, but if you tell family and friends and colleagues, this might help the habit stick. So it's important, as I said, this should be friendly pressure. Um, and the whole point here is that we're self-compassionate about their practice. Um, we're all human beings. And one thing I can guarantee is that you will fail at some point in this practice if you haven't failed already during the week. This is human nature. This is what happens. So anticipate failure, fail, but then get back on the horse and practice again. Now to practice the next day. I'm acknowledging right now, I did last week, and I will continue to do so for the eight weeks of this program. Attention-based training is not easy. It takes time. It takes effort. Um, and session is about trying to get the best. So, in terms of part two of this six, this we call for developing um here is how to leverage the context itself. So what does that mean? So really a lot of the research would show that the best times to generate a new habit would be, for example, um, when you're moving house, when you're retiring, when you're changing jobs, that kind of thing. So that you're using a change in your environment to embed this new habit and your brain is more likely to engage it. Now, as look would have it, we are all undergoing a COVID-19 pandemic at the moment, so we all have the best chance in the world actually to start a new habit. Um, this crisis can be seen as an opportunity to engage and embed this habit. So we can um, get some positive out of something that's quite um, difficult for everybody around the world at the moment. Okay, here's another way to leverage the context um, in terms of developing a new habit, and this is called piggybacking. And really what we're talking about here is we're talking about using an existing habit to couple up with the habit you're trying to develop. So an example might be flossing or brushing your teeth. Many people are very religious about having to brush their teeth and it's a truly embedded practice from the time when they were children. So if this is the case and when you get up and let's say 15 minutes after you've had your breakfast, you brush your teeth, well then it can be a good idea to piggyback the new attention-based training or meditation habit with this brushing teeth habit. So what you do is you introduce your attention-based training sitting practice before your flossing or brushing your teeth practice. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So this really is also a golden rule in terms of developing new habits. You've got to be smart. I'm sure you've all come across um, smart goals um, before in management and things like that. But really this is about making the conditions as easy as possible. Because if you remember, we talked about how the mind and the body will sabotage your practice at any possible opportunity. I'm sure if you tried to practice last week, you would have seen your mind interfere with your practice or your body interfere with your practice. So we need to make the setting as simple as possible so that we give our body and minds the least possible opportunity to sabotage it. So for example, if you're scheduling your practice time for 6.30 and it's dinner time and you've got young kids, that's probably not the best time to make your habit stick. Um, it's not an easy time to practice. Have the space prepared. Don't flip-flop between the kitchen and the attic and the spare room or out in the garden shed. Pick the space. Remember the same place, same time, same position. Make it easy to practice. And I would really recommend that you do this probably today. Don't give too much more time away because you'll forget to do it tomorrow. So maybe at the end of this <clears throat> session today that you pull out your notebook or if you have the manual printed off or if you have notes on your phone that you write out the barriers to your practice last week. So there will have been things that interfered with your practice last week, made things less easy for you. I would urge you to write down these barriers and then in another adjacent column, write down the solutions to these barriers. 
don't leave this to chance. These practices help us make sticky, sticky habits that are sustainable over a long period of time. So here's for me what's the essential and the core element of these six aspects of developing a new habit. Um, and it's sometimes called the habit loop. Um, and you can see in the left here, it's talking about developing cues and rewards. So another word for a cue is a trigger. So the habit loop is about integrating triggers, routines and rewards in order to develop the new habit. And for me, this really is the most important aspect of you being able to develop a new attention based training habit. So I'll try and explain the habit loop um, in a little bit more detail here. So <clears throat> this slide here is showing us an example of a negative habit loop, which is smoking. Um, and what we can see here in this loop, we can see a trigger, which is also called a cue. And um, let's for, say, for example, we have a smoker in work, starts the working day. Let's assume it's in a pre-COVID world where everybody was physically in work and 10.30 comes and it's break time. That's the trigger. So whether that's an alarm or whether it's just the time of day, that's the trigger in this case. The routine in, it, in this instance would be for the individual to get up from the chair in the office or wherever they're working and walk to the smoking area and light up a cigarette. That's the routine. And then the reward in this case, it's very obvious. Um, it's probably going to be nicotine and the nicotine addiction, but smoking can sometimes be also about social interaction in a smoking area. So it can be a little bit more complex than just nicotine addiction. So this is the basic idea of a negative habit loop that's very, very strong. We have the trigger, which is the time of day, and this is just one trigger, obviously. We have the routine, which is walking to the area and lighting the cigarette, and then we have the reward, which is nicotine and social interaction. So let's now look at a more positive habit loop, which would be you setting up your new morning meditation practice. So let's say, for example, we begin with a trigger, which for want of a better example, let's say 6.30 in the morning, your alarm clock goes off. That's the trigger. You've decided to engage in your practice immediately upon waking, for example, in this case. Your routine now, remember, same place, same time, same position. So the same time is 6.30, that's your trigger. You've already set up your practice area, wherever that is, whether it's your bedroom, the shed out the back or the kitchen. In this instance, we're going to say this individual walks downstairs to the chair in the kitchen, sits down, starts the timer and begins to practice. That's the routine. In terms of the reward, it could be a coffee. In my case, it's a coffee. Um, and in this instance, it's a coffee too. Now, it's really important that you provide some kind of reward in this habit loop because brains are often like dogs and that if we want to get them to do something for us, we need to give them some kind of a treat and your brain likes dopamine and um, it likes this neurochemical. It likes it spiking in the brain. If you can couple a practice such as a new habit with a dopamine spike, it's more likely to stick. And um, so the reward, and we'll give other examples of different types of rewards later, and um, doesn't have to be a coffee, obviously, it doesn't have to be a stip stimulant, but you need to provide your brain with some kind of reward in this system so that it wants to engage in the routine and the trigger reminds your brain of this reward. Now, this is very important. So you can see from the previous slide, I showed you an example of a morning routine. Morning routines aren't the same as evening routines. And I'll explain this in a bit more detail in the, in the coming slides. We need to have a different loop for the evening time versus the morning because different things happen in the evening versus the morning. Now, this may sound obvious, but you have to build these kind of routines and regimens in to develop this new practice. So let's say, for example, in the evening time, you're trying to develop your meditation practice. The trigger this time is 9 p.m. And again, you have your nice chair. Let's assume it's in the kitchen again. You walk down the stairs or wherever you are, you walk into the kitchen. You assume the posture, which is upright for the beginning of your practice at least. And you start your timer for two minutes and you engage in the practice. Now this time, it's probably not a good idea to reward your brain with a coffee because you'll be awake for half the night. This time, it might be a hot chocolate or it might be a book at bedtime or it might be a Netflix show. Whatever it is, you need to give your brain the reward again to give it the spike in dopamine so that it wants to engage in this kind of habit. So remember, reward is the key here. So I mentioned the piggyback practice before, and here's an example of how we can introduce the piggyback practice with the habit loop. 
So again, we're assuming an evening time habit loop. The trigger again is 9 p.m. Again, the routine is the same, the same place, same position. We walk to the chair in the kitchen, set our timer and we practice. Except this time we do this before the piggyback. So we're piggybacking on an existing habit and the existing habit in this instance is brushing your teeth. So this works really well if you really are compelled to brush your teeth every night. If you're not, then it's not a suitable habit to piggyback on. This has to be something that you do every evening ritually. So once you brush your teeth, now it's time to reward your brain again. And at this case, maybe you don't want to have a hot chocolate after brushing your teeth. So this time it's a book or again, maybe it's a Netflix show or maybe it's reading um, a story to one of your children. But the importance again is that you reward the brain. And I just want to emphasize this in the slides. You will have these slides in your folder, but just to emphasize this, that if you're introducing um, a new habit and you're piggybacking on the existing one, it's important to put the new habit before the one that you're piggybacking, hence the word piggybacking. OK, so this is really important as far as I'm concerned. And um, you'll see in the manual, um, in the folder for today that you'll have practice templates at the end. And what I'd like you to do this evening is to have a number of different practice templates. So I've shown you two. So one for the AM period and one for the PM period. Don't assume you have the same habit loops because you won't. You have different timings um, and you'll have different rewards. Or maybe you'll have the same, but the timings are very different. Don't assume they're the same because they're not. Um, and I'd like you to fill out, I'll give you an example of, of how I filled out a template here. And I'd like you to fill out your own one. Think about what rewards work and what might not. You might have to play around with this for a few days or even a few weeks before you get it right. But I would encourage you to write it down. When we write things down on paper, they become real. When we leave them in our heads, they tend to be a bit ethereal and surreal and they tend not to have it, not to form the practice. And then we don't develop sustainable practice in the long run. So it's also important, as you might imagine, the weekend, or maybe not some more anymore, but pre-COVID-19, the weekends were very different to the working week. So I would encourage you to have a different weekend plan. So for example, I would imagine that for most people, it's unlikely you get up at the same time on a Saturday and a Sunday versus the working week. And if you're on shift work, it's a different story. Then you have to have different habit loops for different shift, um, different shift phases. Um, of the week, whether it's three on, three off, or whatever it is, but you have to have a different plan depending on whether you're shift on or off. You also need to have, if you're not on shift work, have a different weekend versus a, a working week plan. This is really important, and this may sound like an awful lot of work or over egging the pudding right now, but this will really make you um, get your habit to stick in the long term and make it sustainable. Now, it gets even more fussy than that, that if, for example, you're going on a conference, on Wednesday or Thursday, you need a new practice plan for the conference travel as well, because that is going to upset your routine. If you're going on holidays, don't kid yourself that you're going to wake up at 6.30 and meditate by the pool. You're not. So be realistic and maybe set your meditation time for 10 a.m. And so what I'm saying is if you can have as many regimens as possible for your practice and anticipate all of these things before the time arrives, so before the weekend comes, before the holiday comes, and um, you're more likely to engage and sustain a sticky habit. So this is a no brainer. Obviously, the more you repeat your habit, the more likely it's going to stick. So you need to be engaging with this at minimum on a daily basis. I would suggest for the moment and for the course of this eight weeks that you don't have a day off, especially when we're talking about two or three minute practice morning and evening. So we're talking about repetition on a daily basis, hopefully twice a day every day, seven days a week for eight weeks. Again, I'm going to re-emphasize the repetition component, which is same place, same time, same position, if you can. You might not be able to do this. So for example, your evening time routine might be different to the morning, so you might have to have a different place that you practice. For example, if you have to collect your kids from, from football or swimming, you might have to do it in the car, in the car park, for example. Um, but you leave nothing to chance. Repetition is key. Now, this component, which is the last component um, of the Duke University plan, which is the inherent importance of motivation in developing a sticky, sustainable habit. 
And in my experience, a lot of people forget about this part of how to maintain a sticky habit um, and they think the other aspects are more important. But for me, the motivation as to why you're engaging in this practice is really important. And it's important for maybe you haven't thought about the motivation, but I would encourage you to think about the motivation of why you're trying to do this. Is it just to fill time? And um, if it is, you're less likely to make this a sticky habit. But if you attribute meaning to this practice, you're more likely to develop a sustainable habit. So for example, um, are you doing it for somebody? So maybe you're doing it to be a better dad. Maybe you're doing it to be a better uh, mother, a better friend, a better colleague. Maybe you're doing it because you are sick and tired of being anxious um, and you want to reduce this level inside you because you want to feel some level of normality again. So whatever it is, it doesn't matter. I would say if you're doing it for somebody else and um, human nature being what it is, especially if it's for kids or other people, that tends to make it a little bit sticky. Um, but for me, find the meaning and purpose into why you're engaging this habit. Write it down. Don't just have it sticking in your minds. Put it on in black and white on paper um, and along with all your other practice regimens, this will hopefully solidify your practice and make it stick over the long period of time. So this really is the behavior change checklist. And when you've got your practice regimens done, so I would encourage you maybe this evening to spend some time doing it and maybe some time over the weekend. I would encourage you to, to write down this behavior checklist or print it out or put it on your phone and just check off the sentences as we go down and make sure that you're incorporating these new behaviors to help generate a sustainable habit practice. So number one is have you made it easy to practice? So is your environment stable? So are you practicing in a chaotic morning when everybody's trying to get to work? Are you practicing in the morning or in the in the evening time when everybody's trying to do their homework or when everybody's eating? If you are, you need to get a more supportive, a more stable environment. So you need to ensure that you have a safe space to be able to do this without interruption or with minimum interruption. Next point here, you need to leverage um, any life changes. Now, this would be important if we were in a non-COVID-19 world, but we are, so this is the best time for you to leverage this kind of habit because we're all at home, or most of us are at the moment anyway. And um, so it's a good time to develop a new habit. Think about all the opportunities that you engage in on a daily basis, all the embedded habits and practices, hopefully they're all good ones, and see if you can piggyback the new attention-based training meditation practice onto these existing habits. So you might need to do a bit of detective work with this. You might need to sit down and, and write about your practices. You might need to talk to your partners, or whoever you lived with, to try and decide what habits you actually do engage in every day religiously. And then make it easy, as I said at the start again. Make this easy to do. Write down the barriers and facilitators to this practice. If you've got barriers, mental or physical or environmental, write them down and try and provide some solution to it. So please do that tonight or over the coming days because this will really help you embed the practice. Again, look at your multiple habit loops. So I've described the habit loop. Again, it's a trigger, it's a routine and it's a reward. Make sure you reward the dog, the brain. Make sure you have sensible rewards. Give it the dopamine spike that it wants and then it will want to engage the habit again. Don't be silly, anticipate differences between morning and evening, anticipate the weekend, anticipate a holiday, anticipate um, changes in work and have a different regimen for each change and have it written down on paper. Um, and as I said, the rewards are crucial. Now, a coffee is a short term reward and um, I'm a commuter. When I'm trying to teach people how to do this, I love teaching commuters because they tend to be locked into some kind of metal tube for a certain amount of time in the morning and the evening. And um, so they have no choice but to engage in these practices. And it's really helpful because it helps establish the routine. When I used to get on the train every morning, um, I like my coffee. But part of my reward is my coffee. So I don't get my coffee unless I do my meditation on the train. Um, so that's a short term reward, but you can have longer term rewards. So you can say, for example, when this COVID-19 business eventually eases off somewhat, I'm going to go down by the seaside and I'm going to have an ice cream cone um, or whatever you like to do at the seaside. 
So you can have short term and long term rewards. If you're going to have a long term reward, write it down and have it in your planning um, pack as well. And create the opportunities to try out the practice and the new behavior. So you have to create the space, tell people that you're doing this and encourage conversation about your practice wherever you can. And then finally, attach some kind of meaning to your new practice. Find out why you actually want to tune in on a four o'clock to listen to someone like me on a Wednesday. Um, could you be doing something else? Why are you actually spending this hour? What do you want to gain from this? Is it for you? Is it for other people? Is it a combination of both? Find out what those meanings and, and, and purpose is and attach it to your practice plan. Okay, so that's um, a whistle stop tour through um, behavior change science. There are more complex um, aspects of behavior change science, obviously. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can contact me and we can talk about those if you like. But for me, they are uh, the practices I just talked about today. They're the more co most comprehensive, easiest to apply, and they work. And they're based on empirical data. So I would really encourage you to get out the pen and paper either tonight or the weekend and develop your practice plan and, and engage it. And um, because I'll be checking in with you next week and the coming weeks to see if you have put your templates in, in, in practice. OK, so now we're going to move from the body scan again, like we did last week, um, and we're going to practice for two minutes. Um, and again, we assume the upright position. Hopefully by now you would have chosen your anchor. You know what you prefer, the chosen phrase or the breath. This will be your anchor forevermore now. And um, again, we plant your feet on the ground. Your hands can be on your lap or by your side. We close your eyes. I'll start the timer um, and I'll tell you when we're finished. When we're finished this practice, we'll go into um, a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, um, you can write your, your questions in the chat box um, and I'll hopefully be able to answer um, them to you uh, verbally. Um, okay, so right now let's engage Short two minute practice. Again, upright position with your eyes closed. Continue to breathe normally. Choose your anchor. And meditate. So that's the end of our two minute practice. So take a moment just to open your eyes and resettle yourself. And before we go into the Q&A session this afternoon, um, I just want to remind you that last week was about two minute practice, morning and evening. We're going to add another minute 
on it now. So hopefully that won't be like an eternity for you. So again, this week, the goal is three minutes morning and evening time. Again, just to remind you, same place, same time, same position. I'm going to remind you again about the 66 days. I'm going to remind you that there is no such thing as a good or a bad practice that remember we said the last time that actually the more turbulent and distracting your practice is can often mean that it's actually in fact better because you're getting more practice at disengaging from distraction. So there is no such thing as a good or a bad practice. There's simply your practice. And we acknowledge that we're human beings. We fail sometimes, but we get back up on the horse. Attention based training or meditation of any kind is not easy, um, but the more we do it, and the more we use smart tools like the behavioral change science tools, the more we're likely to stick with it and get the benefits from it um, ultimately. So thank you very much um, for engaging again today. It, it's a pleasure to show you this, this material. Um, and I think we'll just go into the Q&A session if possible. Um, I'm just gonna start it here. OK, um, I've just after seeing a message from from Catherine there um, about the sound. I hope the sound has been OK. Um, can can most people hear me relatively clearly? Jane, is the sound OK? Yeah, Porik, it was fine. It was just for about a few seconds there at one stage, but it, it, it came fine then again. OK, yeah. Yeah. great. Thanks very much. So if you have any questions, uh, please, please ask me. Now is your chance. And again, if um, if it does happen throughout the week that you do have any questions, um, please feel free to uh, to to reach out to me via the email. Um, and do check out the folder contents because there's a lot of uh, things there that uh, maybe might be missing during the session. And um, it's important to read about these things. Um, and especially if there's any technical queries that you might have. Yeah. So did you find it difficult, Lorna, during the week? What what in particular was what was happening there? Maybe if you can type a reply just to give me some idea of what, what was happening. Um, so Pork, she, I don't know if you can see Lorna's response that she was actually looking for the location of the folders again. So we can share that link out again. OK, great. Yeah, yeah no yeah. problem. Lorna will do that. Yeah. Okay. So Michelle has a question. Um, yeah, Michelle, it, it is um, it, it is hard to find it um, to, to find time to do this, and and that's why I hope today was useful for you. Um, that uh, it, it's important to use these little tips and tricks to try and embed your practice, and um, and when you do it, when you make a plan for this kind of thing, it really does make it stick. Whereas if you kind of leave the chance into the day, um, it's 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 much harder to do. So hopefully, yeah, you, you'll be able to identify tons of triggers and rewards, as you say. OK, thanks, Lorna. You're just trying to get your, your head in the space to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would suggest that sometimes what we can do with this type of practice is that we can almost have certain types of stipulations about how we should be before we practice. Um, and I'm not sure if this is what you mean, but I, I come in across this again and again, and I do it myself as well, that f for me, um, it's about, and we'll talk about acceptance in the coming weeks and things like that, but for me, it's it's just about accepting wh whatever's happening at that time, so whether it's tranquil or not, and um, just engaging in the practice when your trigger goes off, which could be your timer um, or that time of day, that you just do it regardless of what's happening, that you get into that routine of just automatically engaging the practice, you know? Um, and you're right, Lorna, I, I do think writing it down is crucial for all of this. Um, as human beings, we need to have things in black and white, I think, 
um, and adopt some kind of strategy to engage it, you know. So thanks for those questions. So if there are no other questions then, I think maybe we'll leave it for today unless anybody else has anything to ask or comment on. I think that's good, Paul. Thank you very much. That's great. Great. OK, so um, we'll put out the links to the folders um, and the link to next week um, and hopefully we'll, you'll join in again. As I said, feel free to reach out and contact me if you have any questions. And remember, it's three minutes morning and evening again this week. Um, oh, great. We have Anita from Bahrain again. Um, fantastic to have Bahrain uh, here. It's, it's really great. It's really important. Um, and I'm glad you joined in again, Anita. So hello to everybody there. So uh, thanks very much, everybody. Um, and hopefully we'll have a chat again this time next week. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.